Hello. 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 Indians in Singapore are a diverse and dynamic community made distinct by their ability to adapt and integrate with local cultures. The political and social economic implications of British colonial rule in the Indian subcontinent were among the fundamental reasons for the mass migration of Indians to various parts of the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. The majority of South Asian migrants who arrived in Singapore and Southeast Asia were colonial personnel, traders, professionals, educators, and skilled and unskilled labour. They brought with them diverse social cultural practices and values unique to their regions of origin. Globalisation and the continued transnational migration of professionals from the subcontinent in recent times has also contributed to the growing diversity of the community in Singapore. This gallery presents a collection of rare artefacts and textiles, illustrative of the diverse cultures of Singapore's Indian communities. These include costumes and accessories, signalling the important role of fashion in making identity and diversity, and objects associated with rites of passage, religion and festivals. Lastly, the gallery presents elements of the journey from India to Singapore, such as travel ephemera and photographs belonging to migrants, as well as the objects they brought with them. Among diasporic communities, dress was often one of the most visible markers of identity. When surveying colonial era photographs of Indians in Singapore in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the elaborate ethnic costumes of these migrants play an important role in suggesting their identity. In this section, a melange of jewellery and costumes are presented to allude to the regional fashion trends associated with the diverse roots of early migrants. Dress provides interesting insights into the lives of diasporic communities. Importantly, dress indicated regional origins. The fabrics embodied the aesthetics unique to different regions across the Indian subcontinent. Dress was also a statement beyond fashion and communal affiliation. It was also a tool for power negotiations. In the case of the convicts, standard clothing was an item of contraband trading. Chins was dispensed for dhoti and wraps, but additional pieces of cloth always came in handy, especially during cooler weather. Instances of convicts flouting authority to ensure compliance of social religious practices, as in the case of 19th century Parsis from the Bombay Presidency, is yet another instance of underlying resistance to colonial authority. The tradition of covering one's head is a pan-Indian one. Headgear served many purposes for men in the subcontinent. They were practical, ceremonial or symbolic. Until recent times, many communities wore some form of headgear on a daily basis. The types of headgear were predominantly turbans like Pagadi or Pagri and Feta or Peta among others, as well as caps such as Topi or Talapa. Attire was also an indicator of cross-cultural influences, as in the case of the Chetty Malacca community. Descendants of early southern Indian traders who married local women, they retained the languages of their mixed parentage and remained largely a Saivite Hindu community. The traditional attire of men is telling of their hybrid origins. This is a traditional talapa or headgear worn by the men of the Chetty Malacca community. Made from batik fabric, the name talapa is a Tamil word. This headgear is but one aspect of the Chetty Malacca community's cross-cultural past. From learning about how dress was a defining moment of identity and adaptation for early migrants, let us journey onward to discovering 
the significance of dress in life cycle rituals. Diversity is inherent in the culture of the Indian subcontinent. The global Indian diaspora is a representation of India's religious, social cultural and regional diversity. In many cases, geography determined the occupational profile of the populace and their motivations for travel outward in the 19th and 20th centuries. Through all this, language remains the most distinct marker of diversity in the diaspora. There are 22 regional Indian languages flanked by hundreds of minor languages and dialects. Even with a clear Tamil majority, there is considerable ethno-linguistic diversity in the Indian community in Singapore, which also includes sizable numbers of Malayalis, Punjabis, Bengalis, Hindustanis, Gujaratis and Telugus, among others. This heterogeneity remains layered and complex. This section of the gallery presents a collection of rare artifacts and textiles illustrative of the diverse cultures of Singapore's Indian communities. These include paraphernalia, costumes and illustrations of life cycle rituals. Dress is one of the most visible and definitive markers of identity within the Indian diaspora. Dress provides interesting insights into the lived experiences and ritual cycles of diasporic communities. Importantly, dress signals class, status and group affiliations. The fabrics reveal not just the affluence of the wearer, but speak of the unique artistry of regional weavers and the aesthetics at play among source communities. This is a pulkari or flower work embroidered cloth. Such embroidered cloths are traditionally gifted to a young bride at the time of her wedding in the Punjab regions of India and Pakistan. An essential part of the bride's trousseau, the pulkari is sometimes designed for everyday wear and at other times for special occasions. An interesting variation of the traditional pulkari is a darshan dwar pulkari, made not for wear but as a gift to the Gurdwara or Sikh temple. Young Punjabi girls are taught the craft of pulkari embroidery in their teen years to contribute to the making of their own pulkari. This is a sapt rangi or seven-colored embroidered textile with large repetitive chevron patterns. The earliest Punjabi women probably arrived in Singapore by the late 19th century based on evidence presented in the form of barracks for married dark policemen provided as early as the 1870s. By the 1921 census, there were 203 Punjabi women in Singapore. This increased to 910 in 1931. At this time, women hailed from a pre-partition Punjab as well as those who might have migrated from within older settled communities in the federated states of Malaya. The social lives of migrant women were bound to places of worship and homes of their Punjabi friends, which led to the formation of congregational prayer groups of women, such as the Isteri Satsang over 70 years ago. Today, within the Punjabi community in Singapore, the sharing of a cultural resource, such as the Pulkari, is seen both within and outside the family. The Pulkari used in wedding rituals is loaned to brides by a matriarch in the community, whereas traditionally, the pulkari would be embroidered by women in the bride's family circle, a product of shared inspiration and craftsmanship. From exploring aspects of diversity as evident in attire and life cycle rituals, please join my fellow docent as she shares the story of one of the oldest Indian festivals celebrated in Singapore. This section of the gallery presents aspects of festival and processions associated with Indian communities in Singapore. One of the larger than life artifacts displayed here is this processional image of Aravan. 
This was donated by the Sri Mariamman Temple at Southbridge Road to the National Museum of Singapore in 1990, together with other processional imagery from the temple's collection. Hinduism has various manifestations in Singapore, both in its urban forms and its diverse folk expressions. Places of worship dedicated to the folk guardian deities such as Muniswaran, Ayanar, Karpanaswami and Madurai Viran allowed for participation in religious life, devotion to the mother goddess in forms as varied as Mariamman, Kali and Draupadi led to the establishment of the earliest places of worship in the 19th century including the Sri Mariamman Temple in Southbridge Road and the Sri Virama Kaliamman Temple on Serangoon Road. Albert Street was once the location for Timidi or fire walking, one of the two of the oldest Hindu festivals in Singapore. The street was known as Timidi Tidal, meaning the place where people tread on fire in Tamil. In 1870, Timidi was relocated to Sri Mariamman Temple at Southbridge Road. The festival dedicated to Draupadi was introduced in Singapore by the Cocker community who specialised in boat building and traced their roots to the seaside Kadalur area in South India. They owned businesses along the Kalang River and lived in the Jalan, Sultan and North Bridge Road areas. Aravan, also known as Airavat or Kutandavar, is a minor character in the Indian epic the Mahabharata. He plays a major role in the cults of Draupadi and Kutandavar, centred in the South and North Arkad districts of Tamil Nadu. Born to the Pandava prince Arjuna and Naga princess Ulupi, Aravan sacrifices himself to the goddess Kali in the hope of victory for the Pandavas during the crucial 18-day battle of Kurukshetra. Tamil tradition recounts Aravan receiving three boons from Lord Krishna prior to his death. The first, that he die a heroic death on the battlefield. In a second boon, Aravan asks that he continue to watch the proceedings at Kurukshetra even after his death on the eighth day. It is this aspect of Aravan that is celebrated by the Tamil cult of Draupadi. A ceremonial severed head of Aravan is especially worshipped during the lead up to and during the Timidi festival. It is symbolic of Aravans witnessing the festival's reenactment of the battle of Kurukshetra. The ceremonial head of Aravan is hence a common motif in temples associated with the cults of Draupadi. The head is commonly in a portable, painted wooden form. Aravan also has a dedicated shrine in some Draupadi temples. This is as seen at the Sri Mariamman temple here in Singapore, where both a permanent installation and processional image are installed. The third boon is an expression of Aravan's desire to be married before his self-sacrifice. Lord Krishna takes on his female form of Mohini and grants this boon. The Kutandavar cult focuses on this boon and celebrates Aravan as a patron god to transgender communities, as seen at the Kuvagam festival. From exploring aspects of Indian diversity, it is now time to discover more about the arduous journeys Indians undertook to arrive in Singapore and the region. From the founding years of modern Singapore, migration of Indians from within the region was complemented by migration from the Indian subcontinent. Direct service to and from Singapore was established by European shipping lines, such as the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company founded in 1837 and the British India Steam Navigation Company Limited founded as the Calcutta and Burma Steam Navigation Company in 1856. With the opening of the Swiss Canal in 1869, steamships replaced sails and services were extended to India and beyond. This development also paralleled the emergence of the new Tanjung Parka Harbour at Kepel in Singapore. Large-scale migration to the Malay Peninsula in the 19th and 20th centuries consisted of controlled and voluntary movement of labour and professional migrants to specific destinations. Penang, Port Swettenham, Singapore and later Port Klang were the points of arrival. During the 20th century, ocean liners such as the SS Dista, SS Rajula, 
State of Madras, SS Jalagopal, and later NV Chidabaram. Plied from Indian ports of Madras, Nagabatinam, and Calcutta to the Strait settlements after the 1980s. They carry sojourners, migrants, and goods. Upon reaching Singapore, new immigrants entered the quarantine station at St. John's Island where they were subjected to health checks to confirm that they were disease-free and to recover from the hardships of the sea voyage. Members of the Dawoodi Bora community arrived in Singapore, primarily from Gujarat in Western India from the mid-19th century. They were principally engaged in commodities trade. Mr. Abbas boy Muhammad Ali and Mr. Abid Ali Hussein established A. Muhammad Ali & Co., an import and export trading firm on Malacca Street. They also sealed their business partnership with the matrimonial alliance of their offspring, Muiz Abbas Boy and Salma Abidali Hussein, the donor of this passport. This passport was issued to Mr. Abbas Boy Muhammad Ali in the Crown Colony of the Street Settlements on 29 April 1936. He was a British-born subject from India who was a resident in Singapore. The British-born subject status was derived from the fact that he was born in British India, which in 1858 became part of the British Empire. Hence, every person born within the dominion and allegiance of the British crown was, based on common law, a British subject. The passport allowed him to pass freely without hindrance to afford him every assistance and protection which he may need. It was issued by Sir Thomas Shenton Whitlake Thomas, Commander-in-Chief of the Street Settlements, on behalf of the Colonial Secretary of the Street Settlements. This passport allowed him access to British territories. Although the passport in the early days of the Street Settlements was no more than a certificate, it was a much-desired status symbol. The British colonial government only granted passports to individuals of wealth and influence. Many of these merchants were loyal British subjects, Hence, the passport was an important source of pride and indicated how well traveled they were. I find passports extremely interesting as they provide us little unexpected details about these migrants. For instance, in this passport, I notice that alongside a photograph of Mr. Abbas Boy, one can also note his profession. He was a merchant. From this passport, I also learned that he was born in the Panchmahal district in Gujarat in Western India on 15 April 1908. He was 5 feet 6 inches tall and his eyes were dark brown while his hair was brown as well. This passport also tells me of some of the places he traveled to, including India and Burma. From stories of origin and journeys, it is now time to find out more about early Indian settlers and pioneers in Singapore. Proceed onward to level 3 and join my fellow docents to discover these fascinating tales of resilience, struggle and success.